Dane County Circuit Court Judge Jill Karofsky is one of three candidates for the state Supreme Court. The general election for the Supreme Court, April 7th, the primary, February 18th. Uh, Judge, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you. I'm super happy to be here. It's great to see you. What's at stake in the April 7th election for this a 10-year term in the Supreme Court, Judge? There's a, there's a lot at stake. Look, I'm running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court because we have to get this court back on track. I've been going all around Wisconsin the past several months, and I hear the same thing from people. They're concerned about what they see on our court. They see justices who do not follow the rule of law. They see justices who make decisions before anyone ever enters the state Supreme Court chamber. They see justices who are more interested in protecting corporations than in protecting our air and our water from corporate pollution. They see justices who are acting like politicians. And all of that feels like corruption to people. Who we have on our Supreme Court really matters. What's at stake is who is going to make important decisions regarding the laws in this state? Who are going to make important decisions regarding gerrymandering? We're going to have a gerrymandering case. There's no doubt about it. Who's going to make important decisions regarding women's access to health care, regarding Wisconsin's response to gun violence, criminal justice reform? What's our democracy going to look like? All of that is at stake for today and for the future of Wisconsin. Well, you say that before they even enter a courtroom, some people know how our Supreme Court justices are going to rule. This echoes a charge from a then-candidate Hagedorn, who said, when I entered the Supreme Court, I felt former Chief Justice Shirley Abramson, I knew how she was going to rule. So how was your charge different from what then candidate and now Justice Hagedorn said? Look, if you look at the decisions Dan Kelly has made, Dan Kelly always rules for the right wing special interest. We had a debate. One example. We had a, we had a debate in November. And he, was, and I covered it. and he was asked the question, give us an example when you have not ruled the same way your personal or political interests lay, and he couldn't do it. I have a long record of being on the bench. Look, I'm the only person in this race who is or who has ever been a trial court judge. Mm -hmm. I heard over 1,700 cases last year, and I can give you example after example where I have followed the rule of law even when I didn't agree with it personally or politically. That is not true for Dan Kelly. He, he always finds in the interests of the right-wing special group. And it's impossible to believe that the law is always on their side, but he always does it. What's, what do you consider the most egregious example of that, Judge? I think if you look at, at two cases, is the best way to do it. And you look at the case that was decided by the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 2016. It was the um, Walker versus Coin, or Coin versus Walker, excuse mm -hmm. me, regarding the rules, administrative rules case for the Department of Public Instruction. The, the Supreme Court made a decision in 2016. In 2019, they ruled the complete opposite direction. And as Justice Ann Walsh Bradley said in the dissent, the only thing that changed was the makeup of the court. Now, you said you, you said you had two examples. Do you want to? Uh, I want to give you a chance to offer a second one. I, no, I was saying that there's two cases. The second case was the Koshki case, where they changed the decision. It was the Koshki case in 2019. Okay. I, was, I was talking about two separate cases. Yeah, thank you for clar clarifying that. You're the perceived Democrat in this race. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, look, they're gonna they're. Um, the other side, you know, Dan Kelly and the people supporting him are going to, you know, um, say that I'm a Democrat and that I'm a liberal and, and all kinds of things. And Here's, your response? My response is this, that I will tell you what my values are. I will, I've been very, very open and honest about what my values are. But dis even with those values, I always follow the rule of law. So, look, my values are this. I was born and raised in this state. I was born and raised in South Central Wisconsin. My mom was, was mayor of Middleton when I was growing up. She was one of the first women mayors in Wisconsin history. I watched her do things like bring emergency medical service into Middleton. She brought buses in so folks had access to public transportation. My dad was a local pediatrician. When he retired, the first thing he did was open up a free clinic so that teens would have access to health care. My parents taught me the importance of public service, of taking care of other people in my community. I am now the head of my own house. I'm the single mom of two teenagers. My kids and I all went to public school. We benefited from great, great 
teachers in those schools. I talk to my kids about the importance of workers' rights and women's rights and human rights and civil rights. When I talk to my kids and I ask them, I, I said, I'm thinking about running for Supreme Court. What are you concerned about? My kids are concerned about gun violence. They don't want to go to school for code red drills anymore. My kids are concerned about the climate crisis. They see corruption on the state and the federal level, and they're looking to the grown-ups in the room to solve these problems. Those are the values that I have. Those are the values I'm bringing to this race. Those are the values I'll bring to the Supreme Court. But I have the record in this race of following the rule of law in every single decision I make when I am on the bench. Have you just said um, that we need tougher gun safety rules? What I am saying is that I'm concerned about gun violence and that when I talk to my kids, look, my kids can tell you where you sit on a toilet seat if there is an active shooter in your school and you happen to be caught in the bathroom. That's what they're learning in school. Instead of being in class, learning all kinds of other things, they have to take their time to learn how to keep themselves safe. But Supreme Court justices don't make laws, they interpret it. And that is my point, Steve, is that I am, I am here and I'm saying, these are my values. These are the values that I have. These are the values I'll bring to the Supreme Court. What Dan Kelly is doing is he's pretending he doesn't have values. He won't talk about what his values are. But then when he's on the Supreme Court, he doesn't follow the rule of law. He always rules in the interests of the right-wing special interest group that worked hard to get him on the court and is working really hard to keep him on the court. Two other, it's, uh, two other campaign themes that are important to your campaign I want to ask you about. How could you, as a Supreme Court justice, uh, address the issue of ra racial justice because it's one of your campaign themes? Absolutely. So being a trial court judge, what I see every day is that we have racial disparity in our criminal justice system. I also see that we have an issue with mass incarceration in this state. The first thing that I can do is acknowledge that there's a problem. So let me just say it here. Those are two problems. The second thing that I can do right now when I'm on the bench is I can take steps to try to decrease the impact of those things. So I do everything that I can to refer people to treatment courts, to OWI treatment court, to a drug treatment court, to the veterans treatment court that we have here in Dane County. I also refer as many cases as I can to our community service program. We have a year old community service program in Dane County. So I can send people there instead of sending them to jail, instead of ordering them to pay a fine when their ability to pay a fine is, is very, very low. So that's the second thing I can do. The third thing I can do is I can inform the policymakers. Right, I'm not a policymaker. I'm not running to be a policymaker. But I can tell the policymakers what I see. I can tell them what I see in my courtroom as the person in this race who's on the front line of the, of the justice system for most of my career. I can tell them the things that I have seen and the things that I do see to inform them and their policymaking decisions. Why does Wisconsin lead the nation in the incarceration of African Americans, Judge? Um, I, think, I think a number of reasons. I think uh, truth in sentencing has been a problem in this state that as a judge, I don't have the ability. I, I, when I sentence someone, I'm trying to predict what's going to happen 5, 10, 15, 20 or more years from now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have had um, that there are, are certain laws that impact communities of color more than they impact um, other communities. And that's just, it's had a disparate impact on people of color in this state. Do we need to repeal the truth in sentencing laws enacted in the 1990s? Um, again, I, I, think, I think we need to take steps to reform our criminal justice system, and that would be one way to do it. Okay. And another uh, important uh, issue to you is to protect the environment. Have recent court decisions at, at the county court of appeals or Supreme Court level hurt environmental protections in Wisconsin? I think that we need to do everything to, to, that we can to protect our environment. And I think that, that there are, um, that there have been cases, that there have been Supreme Court cases that have talked about the administrative agencies that we have in this state. And some of those administrative agencies are responsible for keeping our air and our water clean. And when a case comes down that talks about, the, the Koshki case that talks about doing away with the, the the administrative, the, the, the administrative state, as they called it, that that means that we won't, there, there won't be agencies protecting our air and our water. Now, you were elected to Dane County Bench in 2017. Yes. And we've had two Supreme Court elections in 18 and 19. Now you're a candidate. As a candidate, what did the Supreme Court elections in 18 and 19 
lessons learned teach you? So a couple of things. Um, when I look at the race that uh, Justice Dallet ran, and Justice Dallet is endorsing me, and I'm, I'm really honored to have her endorsement, uh, she uh, was successful in her bid, I believe, because she did things like talk about the fact that she was a sitting just, she, excuse me, she was a sitting trial court judge when she ran for Supreme Court. Milwaukee County. Milwaukee County, right. And that resonates with voters. Voters want to see what someone's track record is. They want to see how they perform as a judge before they elect them to the Supreme Court. She talked about the fact that she had been a prosecutor. I also spent a number of years as a prosecutor. Uh, I know how to be smart on crime. I know the importance of protecting the rights of individuals, of defendants, of witnesses, of victims, and members of the public. And Justice Dallet uh, talked about that as well. She talked about her values, and I'm talking about my values. The race that we had last year taught us that there is outside money that came into the end, at the end of that race that is very likely to come into the end of this race. Um, the right wing does not want to lose Dan Kelly on the Supreme Court. He has been a consistent vote for them every single time he has had the chance to cast his vote while on the Supreme Court. So they are going to continue to influence this election. They are, continue, they are going to continue to bring lots and lots of money into this race. So They are going to continue to do everything they can to keep him on the court. Well, another one of your campaign goals is you oppose big money special interests. So how can you compete financially when every potential giver is a potential conflict of interest. Either they are a litigant or they're, they're an attorney who may appear before the, the, the court. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question because one of the things that I think we need on our Supreme Court is a clear and a strong recusal rule. Everybody in this state. And it should say what? Every, every voter in the state needs to understand what the rule is. Every donor in this state, every candidate in this state. I don't know the exact wording of that rule, but I, I know this, Steve, that the Supreme Court had an opportunity to draft a rule. They had an opportunity to have a hearing, to bring in all the stakeholders and to listen to them and to listen to what each individual person or group thought the rule should be. And then from all that information, they could have crafted a rule. And then everyone would have known what it was. But they didn't do that. They didn't even hold a hearing to be able to gather the information. So I think what we need to do is we need to start by having a hearing. We need to listen to people. We need to craft a rule. And then we need to make sure people abide by that rule. I would be happy to abide by that rule. So you would bring back that proposed rule that was offered, I think, three or four years ago, correct? So not the rule that I would, I would bring. You would bring the subject back. Yeah, I would bring the subject back, and I would make sure that we had a fair process, that we had a process whereby everyone could be heard, and then with all that information, you could craft a smart rule. Have you put up any guardrails in terms of who you will or will not take money from for your campaign? Um, we will, look, if we, um, we are not going to take money from uh, corporations that are polluting the environment. Um, and we are, if there is someone who gives us lots and lots of money, um, I will recuse myself on the Supreme Court. Well, that was one of my questions. What will be your criteria for you to decide when to step off a case? Well, at this point, the criteria is what every judge has to do, and that is if there is a conflict of interest or there is the appearance of impropriety, I will get off. I, I do that in cases in Dane County all the time. That's step one. Step two that has been suggested is that, that a Supreme Court justice state the reason why she or he is stepping off. Will you give a public reason? Um, I, I would say, I, 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 as I'm sitting here right now, I can't see why not. Okay. Um, in past elections, what candidates uh, have written when they were in college on social media have played a role? Um, uh, is that fair game for a Supreme Court election? I think whatever, look, each individual voter has to decide for himself or herself what value they're going to they're gonna place on it. I think knowing what people's values are and where they came from is important. That's why I'm out there with my values. That's why I talk about them all the time. Again, for Dan Kelly to pretend that he doesn't have any values, doesn't, it, it, it's, it, people aren't fooled by that. People know that he has values. But he's saying, I don't have values, I'm a Supreme Court justice. That's impossible. We all do. We all have values. 
Um, I'm willing to talk about mine. He's not. Two or three years ago, I forget to date, the uh, ad administrative sessions of the court were closed. Should they be reopened? Yes. Why? Because I think it's important for people to understand how the third branch of the government works. What goes on in, in those discussions? How administratively is, is this branch run? I think it's important for people to be able to see that. It's their court. It's their court system. We need people to have the utmost confidence in the judiciary. And what has happened with the corruption on our Supreme Court is that people's confidence in the judiciary has been eroded. So whatever we can do to fix that, we need to do. Corruption is a strong term. Uh, are you using that? You write, are you using that largely, or are you uh, specifically uh, charging that with uh, against uh, Justice Kelly? I think Justice. Look, this isn't my word. This is word. This is the the people who I am listening to as I'm traveling around the state. This is what they are seeing. When they see a justice who always decides on the favor of the right wing special interests, when they see a justice, who, they know how he's going to decide before the cases ever get to the Supreme Court. When they see a justice who um, who is acting the way that he is, that feels like corruption to people. That's not just that's not just Jill Karofsky coming up with this. That's what people around the state of Wisconsin are seeing. If there is an ethics complaint filed against the Supreme Court justice, and there's not so many other justices recuse, how should that be resolved? I think ultimately it's resolved by the voters. By the voters. I mean, ultimately, right, if there aren't enough people to hear, if there aren't enough other justices who are able to hear the ethics complaint right now, the voters get to decide. There's no provision now for um, if enough uh, justices step off a case there's no provision for a circuit court judge or a, a retired court of appeals judge to step in and serve temporarily. Should there be? Um, I think that we, we need to figure out how we're going to um, police the Supreme Court so we don't get into the situation that we got in with, uh, with Justice Prosser a number of years ago. Um, and w whatever that system is or process is, it needs to be fair and everyone needs to follow it. Um, I would need to think more deeply about whether or not bringing a, a circuit court judge up or a court of appeals ju judge up is the way to solve that problem. But it's, it's, a, it's a problem. It's an issue. Because right now, because the terms are so long, really the only remedy is waiting until the end of someone's term. How would you get to know and establish working relationships with some of the justices who you may have philosophical and legal disagreements with? Sure. So I've been a consensus builder my whole career. When I was in the Dane County DA's office, I worked with defense attorneys from the, uh, from the private bar and from the public defender's office. I worked with probation agents. I worked with victim advocates. I worked with judges. We worked hard on criminal justice reform because I knew how important it was to pull in all kinds of stakeholders to make important decisions in Dane County. When I was at the Wisconsin Department of Justice, I worked again with defense attorneys. I worked with Republicans. I worked with Democrats. I worked with people in the administration. I worked with legislators. I worked with people in the administrative agencies. I was able to do things like craft a rule. You don't ever see a victim's name in a court of appeals decision or brief or a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision or brief. It was because I was able to bring that issue you to the the um, the judicial council and work with this whole group of people and to be a consensus builder and to get a rule passed and I would use those same skills on the Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, I know almost all the justices who are on the Supreme Court some I'm some I'm friendly with I'm, I'm cordial with all of them and I believe that I would be able to find places where we would agree. I think that there are places where we would agree to disagree. And I think that there is a lot in the middle where I would be able to, to persuade them. Several years ago, when the amount being spent by all parties on Supreme Court elections dramatically increased, there was a discussion whether we should have appointed or elected judges. What's your position? I, I think having Supreme Court justices elected is really important. I think that we should be accountable to the voters in the state of Wisconsin. I think that we should get all around the state just like I have done and learn from voters. I have learned so much from people 
in my time traveling around the state for many, many months. And I think that is an, to, that we would miss out on an opportunity. Anyone who is running for Supreme Court, anyone who is elected to the Supreme Court, misses an opportunity to connect with thousands of people. So I think, I think we should be elected. I think to get the money out, we need to talk about a recusal rule. At That's what solves that problem. At one point, there was a public election fund for candidates that, run, that ran for the Supreme Court. Uh, that was abolished. Should we consider going back to that, Justice? I, I, think, I, think, that that, I think that that would help, but you still, without a, without a clear recusal rule, you're gonna, you're gonna, the problem that we have today is going to continue. Okay. Uh, the issue of civil Gideon. What, uh, someone not accused of a crime but facing difficult civil court action, child custody, maybe eviction. Should they have court-appointed uh, attorneys? The court system is so confusing for people. It's confusing for lawyers. When people come into a courtroom and they are facing an issue like that, yes, look, the, you know, because I'm in a trial court, I see, I heard over 1,700 cases last year. I see every day how the law impacts real people. The law is not an esoteric exercise if it's your divorce and someone is telling you how your property is gonna be divided up and where your kids are gonna sleep tonight. And it's not an esoteric exercise if you are a landlord or a tenant in an eviction action. Those proceedings are confusing and they can be life-changing. One, you know, one afternoon in the courtroom can be life-changing for people. So yes, I think the more people who are able to be afforded the advantage of having an attorney in the court system, the better. The, um, the potential cost of a civil, civil Gideon is pretty high. How, how would you pay for it, Judge? That would have to be a question for the, for the legislature. You know, I think that we, I know in Dane County and throughout the state that there are a number of attorneys who give hours and hours of pro bono, pro bono time to, to help people. We could, you know, one thing we could do is try to grow that so that there, it, there wouldn't be an additional cost. But, um, you know, we, we would have to figure out, the legislature would have to figure out how to pay for something like that. The, for decades, uh, public defenders, uh, their, their reimbursement rates were not increased. And you had, uh, on the other side, you were losing qualified ADAs, assistant district attorneys. What are your thoughts on how well, well compensated public defenders, ADAs, and judges are now? Um, look, there's a, there's a problem in the state, and we can see it all around with the public defender pay. Uh, we get emails every, every once in a while from judges. It doesn't happen as much in, in Dane County, where I sit, but around the state, where the public defender's office has called hundreds of different people to try to get representation for somebody. And the problem is, is that that person is sitting in jail while all those phone calls are being made. Their case is at a complete standstill, not because they've done anything to make the case go slower, but because we can't find them a lawyer. That's a, that's a problem. Um, we see the problem with the, with the district attorney's offices and that the, the cases just move less, they move slower because there aren't enough people to be able to handle all of the cases. And, and there's a problem, um, I know we see it in Dane County and, uh, and it's happening in other places around the state too, is you have less experienced people. And so, you know, we all suffer when, when that happens. Victims suffer when there's a less experienced DA. Um, the public suffers, w we all do. Um, you've worked for, uh, as a uh, ADA, you work for the state, now you're a judge. Talk to me about the problem of juvenile justice, juvenile criminal justice, the, the proposal to close the two state prisons. What are your thoughts on what they should be replaced with, how, how they should be funded, and your overall thoughts on how the criminal justice system now serves juveniles? Sure. So I was at the Department of Justice in the Office of Crime Victim Services when the complaint came in from Lincoln Hills. Um, I don't think I slept for 10 nights Why? after because Why? when I read about what happened to those kids. Um, we, none of us as adults would stand for what happened to those kids if it happened to, to one of us, but, but they are kids up there. Um, they are up there for a reason. They, they did something and they needed to be re removed from their communities, but to be treated the way that they were treated was inhumane. Was that a problem with uh, DOC uh, guard training, or was it a problem with not having enough um, the, the, the vacancy rates, or was it a problem with outdated facilities, or is it a problem with the fact that 
kids from Milwaukee shouldn't be 300 miles away? It's, it's, it, was, it was a combination of things. It was um, the, the perfect storm. Okay. I think when we're thinking about what we're going to do with juveniles, having them be closer to their families is hugely important. Okay. Because for someone to get on a bus in Milwaukee and go all the way up to Lincoln Hills, it's four or five hours on a good day. Okay. And that's just, th that's not doable for most families. That's not doable for most people. Do you like the idea of closing the two juvenile facilities and replacing them with regional facilities? I think, what, I think whatever we can do to make sh to get those kids closer to their homes makes sense, yes. Okay. Um, but again, look, I'm not a policy. I'm not a policy maker, but I, I do I think that that decision was a good one. Yeah, but you said earlier, with your experience, you're willing to offer I'm advice willing to, I'm to willing the to policy makers, the I'm willing, legislators. I'm willing to talk about what I see, what I have seen, what I witnessed too. Okay. Uh, given your experience as a violence against women prosecutor, the head of the Office of Crime Victim Services for the State Department of Justice, do you support the proposed Marcy's Law constitutional amendment? So I have not read the final amendment um, that is going to be that we're all going to vote on in April. So I would need to, to read through it in its final form. I read through the very first proposal that came to Wisconsin and has changed quite a bit since then. Okay. Um, but is Wisconsin doing a significantly better job of helping victims than when you started your career? I will, I will say that Wisconsin has been on the forefront of giving victims a voice and protecting their rights from the beginning. We were the first, we were the first state to pass a constitutional amendment to give victims rights. Uh, and in my courtroom, um, you know, some of the things that I've learned from working on the front line of the criminal justice system and helping victims is that it's really important to treat everyone equally and fairly and respectfully. And that's what happens in my courtroom, whether to, to victims, to defendants, to witnesses, to litigants, to attorneys, to members of the public who just happen to stop by my courtroom and members of the press. Everyone is treated fairly and equally and respectfully. Uh, final question. You've talked about uh, the incumbent, Justice Kelly, but uh, there's another, th uh, there are three names on the uh, February 18th primary ballot. Uh, differences with uh, Marquette Professor uh, Ed Fallon? Sure. Uh, I, think, I think Professor Fallon and I have a number of differences. Um, to start off with, um, he's never won a, an election and I've never lost an election. Second of all, I'm a sitting judge. I have spent my career on the front line of the justice system. I have been a prosecutor. I have worked around the state, every county in this state, as the head of Wisconsin's Office of Crime Victim Services. All of those experiences are something that Professor Fallon doesn't have. Um, I also have experience in, in civil law. I was general counsel at a national nonprofit where I worked on issues of copyright law and contracts and employment law. And I've been a professor. I was a professor at Wisconsin's only public law school as a, I taught trial advocacy in a class I created on victims in the criminal justice system. If you combine the number of cases that both of my opponents have handled, they can't come close to the number that I have seen as an attorney and as a judge. If you look at the depth and breadth of their experience and combine it, you don't come close to the depth and breadth of experience that I bring to this race. Should I accept that as a closing argument, or you have, you have, how's that? <laughs> I think I think that's fine. I, you know, I'll just I'll just say this: um, our campaign is going really, really strong. We had okay. some great momentum out of twenty nineteen that we're bringing into twenty twenty. The primary you already mentioned this. The primary is February eighteenth. February eighteenth. General, General election, election is April seventh. Dane County Circuit Court Judge Jill Karofsky is one of three candidates for the Supreme Court. The 10-year term will be decided primary February 18th, as you just said, general election April 7th. And just a programming note, uh, WISI Wis Wis is scheduled to interview Justice Kelly and Mr. Fallon on January 27th. Judge, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Steve. It was great to see you. Thank you very much. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 